Hello, and welcome to the Divine Nine discussion at Dickinson. The Divine Nine has received an enormous amount of attention um, and increased visibility as a result of the 2020 election cycle. At Dickinson, we have two collegiate chapters of the Divine Nine among our student organizations. And we also have three senior leaders that represent the Divine Nine um, as members of the National Pan-Hellenic Council. My name is Bronte Burley Jones, and I am a Diamond Life member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Along with me today, I have George Stroud, Dean and Vice President for Student Life and a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, and Kendall Isaac, General Counsel and member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity. Today, we are excited to share our personal experiences of members of the Divine Nine. So, Kendall and George, why don't we start by sharing where we were initiated and what drew us to our respective organizations. Uh, let's go in founding date order. So George, that would make you first. Uh, thank you, Bronte, and hello, everyone. Um, as Bronte mentioned, my name is George Stroud. I'm Vice President for Student Life and Dean of Students. I was initiated into Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated at Slippery Rock University, which uh, was Xi Mu chapter uh, of Alpha Phi Alpha. Um, and uh, that was in 1991, spring of 91 was my initiation uh, date. For me, what drew me to the, to the, well, to the organization was that I, um, as a first generation college student, did, was not aware of fraternities and sororities, to be quite honest, when I stepped foot on the campus. So when I first got there, the first individuals that I happened to meet, one was my RA, who was an African-American male and happened to be the first black president of student government, a member of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. He was actually the president of the chapter when I first got there. And then there were a number of other prominent members um, on campus who happened to be members of the organization. And what I happened to see were all these guys walking around on campus with briefcases and dressed up in suits going to class and couldn't understand who these people were and why they were dressed up in, in such attire. And really it drew my attention to them. And as I got to see the influence that these individuals had on campus, it really drew my attention to who they were and what they were involved in. And the more I got to know them, the more I got to realize that I had um, things in common with these individuals and in common with what they were trying to accomplish on campus and further in life. And it was because of many of those experiences with those individuals that I decided that um, being a member of this organization was right for me. Thanks, George. Um, there are several things that are similar in our stories. I actually come from a family of Deltas. Um, and when I take a look at my family, um, both um, on my paternal and maternal side, I would say the two women who've had the greatest influence on me are both members of Delta Sigma Theta. Um, in my hometown, uh, whether it was at school, church, or in the community, uh, the women who were my mentors just so happened to be members of Delta Sigma Theta. So when I arrived on the campus of American University, like you, George, uh, the women that I saw who were in power were women of Delta Sigma Theta. The one black cheerleader was a member of Delta Sigma Theta. The two black RAs were members of Delta Sigma Theta. Uh, the director of the choir, the gospel choir, was a member of Delta Sigma Theta and from my hometown. And so that solidified the decision for me. Um, I pledged at American University uh, the spring of 1989. Um, and next week, I'll celebrate 32 years in the sisterhood. Uh, so Kendall, tell us about your story. Thank you, Bronte. My story begins very humble beginnings. <laughs> and actually, it was seriously 1988 is when my story begins. And actually it was with Sigma Beta Club, which is the young brothers or little brothers of Phi Beta Sigma fraternity. At that time, I really had no real knowledge of Greek life, but I had a friend that invited me to a Sigma Beta Club meeting, went to that meeting my junior year of high school. I enjoyed it, so I actually became president of the chapter my senior year in high school. And at that point, I started to really get more of an understanding about you know, what it meant to be in the, um, in the blue and white. And I looked forward to joining Phi Beta Sigma when I went off to college. 
actually, and, and one quick quip about Sigma Beta that taught me a lot was how to really speak a little better, how to act, how to walk, and most importantly, how to eat, that we would go to dinner and they would explain to us proper etiquette at a dinner table. And when I went to the very first dinner, I was really upset when I ordered filet mignon and I did not get a piece of fish on my plate, had no idea. So I learned something and I've continued to learn since then. Went to Ohio State University, I'm sorry, the Ohio State University, pledged Phi Beta Sigma, Delta Omicron chapter, came into the organization on April 17th, Good Friday of 1992 at 11 was the hour, 28 the minute and 14 was the second. And that was the beginning of a lifelong love affair with Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. Thank you, Kendall. Um, so Kendall and George, a lot of our viewers um, won't necessarily know that leaders and public figures that they know are members of our organizations. So George, why don't you start us off? Can you name just a few of the more notable members of Alpha Phi Alpha? Uh, thank you. Um, yes, it, it is true that each of our organizations has had a number of members, um, countless members who have contributed um, to, uh, to th this world, to technology, to education, the, the legal field, and, and Alpha is no different. You know, some of the most notable Alphas, uh, for those of you out there, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Thurgood Marshall, um, W.E.B. Du Bois um, are some of the most notable members there. Also, um, people may not know that the newly elected senator from uh, the state of Georgia, Georgia, Raphael Warnock is, is a member. And he's also ironically the, the senior pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church where Martin Luther King um, pastored as well. Um, from the uh, entertainment side, um, many of you may be fans of the show Power. Amar, uh, Amari Harwick um, is an alpha and Hill Harper um, from, from uh, the entertainment field as well. And then from the area of athletics, I would say Jesse Owens would probably be one of our most prominent uh, members of Alpha Phi Alpha. And so there are, there are a good number of members. I won't continue to go any further because I want to leave time for my two colleagues here to, to make sure that they can um, talk about their prominent members as well. George, that's not a challenge for a lady of Delta Sigma <laughs> Theta. Uh, so where shall I begin? Let's start with Mary McLeod Bethune. Uh, Shirley Chisholm, Barbara Jordan, Dr. Uh, Dorothy Irene Height. Um, if we want to talk about entertainment, Lena Horn, Cicely Tyson, Aretha Franklin, Dr. Janetta Cole. And if you paid attention to the impeachment trials, uh, Representative Stacey Plaskett. Um, so uh, Kendall, we'll kick it to you. Uh, who are the famous men of Phi Beta Sigma? Yes, uh, quite a few. We have John Lewis, George Washington Carver, James Weldon Johnson, the uh, author of the Black National Anthem, I might say, Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale, the creators of the Black Panther Party. We have um, four members who, at least four, who were presidents of African nations. Uh, we also have one honorary, an honorary member who was a former president of the United States Univer University, goodness gracious, the United States of America, and that would be Bill Clinton. And as far as the, the athletic world goes, we have probably the best wide receiver in Jerry Rice and the best running back in Emmett Smith. And I could go on, but I don't want to embarrass my colleagues with the, the wealth of uh, people we have in our roster. So um, one thing I would hope our viewers can note, there is a fair amount of good spirited competition between the Divine Nine organizations um, and it really, you see us all smiling because it really is fueled by a lot of love and respect for the contributions of our organizations. Um, so that's a perfect segue into asking um, both George and Kendall to share um, one of their more me memorable moments um, as a member of the Divine Nine. Uh, George, going back to the first, uh, you wanna kick us off? Sure, um, so what I would say is when I was being initiated into the organization, my advisor at the time, who was a faculty member at Columbia Rock University, used to say to us, 
you all are not official members or not true members of the organization until you've been to a regional or national conference. That there will solidify your experience and get you to and help you to know what the organization is about. And I didn't fully understand that until I had my first opportunity to go to a regional um, uh, conference. And my, that first regional was my senior year at Princeton University or in Princeton, New Jersey. And walking in and seeing all of these men, um, some my age, others much older who were life members of the organization, it really gave me an opportunity to see what it meant for to join an organization in which we said this was a lifetime commitment. And I got to understand what that meant. And I also had the opportunity to see what was the business of Alpha, sitting in those business meetings, understanding why decisions were made, how they were made, it really impacted how I viewed the organization moving forward. And it really cemented for me that I needed to remain involved um, and that this was something more than just an undergraduate activity, um, that this was something that was meaningful, not only for my life, but could be meaningful to the lives of people who were coming behind me. So for me, that, that was one of the really true um, life-changing experiences for me within the organization. Thanks, George. Um, I would say that my most meaningful experience um, as a member of Delta Sigma Theta was working at our national headquarters. Um, I had the great fortune of working there while I was in graduate school in Washington, DC. Um, and I have to tell you, walking into that building every day, and the first thing that I saw being the portrait of the 22 founders, um, that was absolutely empowering. Um, my favorite room in the building um, is the boardroom. And in that room are the pictures of all of our past national presidents uh, with the portrait of Sadie T.M. Alexander um, on its own separate wall. Um, and Sadie T.M. Alexander is the first in so many, first to get a JD, first to get a PhD. Um, and so the affirmation that flowed from that experience in that building, um, and then the mentors that I had the opportunity um, to have during my years at headquarters. Um, I have to tell you, being there around those women um, and the people that I had the good fortune to meet during the four years that I worked there really taught me to dream bigger dreams. Um, and I left our national headquarters and moved to Austin, Texas to do my doctoral work, um, having one of the past national presidents having written my letter of recommendation. Um, so I would say my experience working at our national headquarters um, it really um, was a transformational and very empowering experience for me. Um, Kendall? Yes, well, I'm not gonna be quite as, as scholarly and as student as my colleagues here, uh, but they truly impressed me. So my, my story is a little bit different and I won't go into great detail. That will be another discussion for another day, but I will say that my entryway into the fraternity on um, at Ohio State University was a little challenged. Uh, there a few things occurred that that really made me start to question if I was doing the right thing, and whether the, the this brotherhood was really for me. But then, a few weeks later, um, two of my uh, fraternity brothers and I made a road trip down to Atlanta, and we went to the Atlanta. Black Greek picnic. It was called something else, but I, I won't say it because I'm trying to maintain my dignity and respect for the, the viewers. So we went to this particular or, uh, event and it was, it was the first time I just felt this brotherly love. It did not matter um, who you were, what chapter, there was just so much hugging, um, talking to each other. And it wasn't just Sigma talking to Sigma, but it was Sigma talking to Alpha and Delta and AKA and, and Zeta. And everyone was just so happy and engaged and, and just having a good time. Uh, a lot of things happened I will not speak to, but it was a wonderful occasion. And it really made me say, you know, I did make the right decision going into the organization. And then actually coming back to Ohio State, something else that, that made me understand the importance of the Divine Nine in particular. And that was when we, we all came together and we did a unity step for campus and just working together, collaborating, figuring out how to get past you know, the, the 
silly differences we might have had on campus and, and putting that together and developing friendships along the way, I really enjoyed that and, and it made me greatly appreciate the fact that I was not only a member of Sigma, but a member of the Divine Nine. Okay, we're gonna shift gears just a bit. Um, can um, each one of us um, talk about our respective roles here at Dickinson um, as a member of the senior leadership team? Uh, George? So yes, um, again, as in student life, um, the way I explain it, and, and I often joke with our students during orientation, um, because often people don't understand what student life is. And, and to, to that point, my mother often doesn't, you know, I've been in doing this work for almost 30 years now, and she still doesn't understand what student affairs is. So the way I try to explain it to her is that um, the vast majority of the things that happen outside of the classroom, I am typically somewhat involved. And so I see my role as an advocate for students and helping our students um, navigate this institution so that they can be successful and graduate here and helping to make sure that they are well-rounded students. So whether that's helping them with some of the activities that they're involved in or walking them through even the conduct process because wearing my Dean hat, I deal with conduct, but that's an educational process as well and helps them to understand um, responsibility um, to, a, to the community and for a greater good or leading them through um, navigating challenges that may happen on the field of play with athletics. So just walking those students through and being an advocate to make sure that they have a positive experience on campus, but also learning and developing skills that will help them um, as they move on in life. Thanks, George. Um, as the Vice President for Finance and, and Administration, um, I would say that my, my role is that of the Chief Re Resource Officer for the college. Uh, so whether that's human resources, our financial resources, or our fiscal resources in the form of our buildings and grounds, um, those are my primary areas of responsibility. Um, I also uh, chair our emergency response um, efforts here at the college. Uh, so that means that for the past uh, 10, 11 months, we've been actively engaged in COVID uh, response. Um, and, then, and then finally, I share responsibility for risk management uh, with Kendall. So that's a perfect pivot to you, Kendall. Thank you. So as general counsel, I am the college attorney. Back to you, Bronte. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, as, as the college attorney, I, I do certainly share risk management with Bronte. And I also get involved with making sure our policies are the way they need to be to make sure that we're staying in compliance with the the myriad of regulations that impact higher education. Truly, in, in my office, we deal with uh, a college campus is, is like a mini city of sorts. We have residents and, um, and residence life. We have many facilities that, that Bronte oversees. And we deal with everything from A to Z, from animals to zoning. We have animal challenges, we have zoning challenges, and every letter in between, I could probably give you an example of a legal issue that we that we have to deal with and that flows through my office. So it, it's it's challenging, um, but I, I certainly enjoy it. And if I do my job correctly, you'll never know I exist. Thanks, Kendall. Okay, so now we're going to try to connect the dots. Um, the three of us know that our organizations are committed to a lifetime of service, um, and there are also organizations that believe in the impact of the greater um, organization, right? Bringing together the collective impact. So can, can each one of us talk about how that, um, those principles of our organizations um, inform our leadership styles here at Dickinson? Uh, George, you kind of touched on that, but uh, maybe you'll expand on that a little more. Yes, um, that, that's actually a really good question. I appreciate that. I, I will say, you know, you know, our, our motto is, first of all, servants of all, we shall transcend all. And um, I really look at that servants of all. And from a leadership standpoint, I look at my role and, and my job and always have as a servant leader, um, meaning that I am here um, because the students are here. I am here to make sure that they have everything that they need in order to be successful. Um, their success is my success. Um, and so I look at it through that lens and advocating to make sure that this is a better place for them 
um, and what little pieces that I can do in my time here on campus um, to make sure that not only the students now have a good experience, but trying to set the table for students to come behind. And so I've always looked at my work from that service or servant leadership perspective. Thanks, George. I, I think that's something we share in common. Um, I would say um, one of the first poems that I learned as a Delta was about the violet. The violet is our official sorority uh, flower. Um, and it's interesting because there are verses in the poem that say, violets are beautiful um, as a standalone, but they are best, they are best um, when they are naturally clustered. Um, and so that, that sense of teamwork um, and strong teams is something that I bring to my leadership position. Um, so whether that's in the form of mentoring the members of my staff or mentoring students. Um, now the average person would not think of the college's chief fiscal officer as a person who mentors students. Um, but that does happen uh, in Old West. In fact, um, my, my right hand, my assistant Vicki said, um, I think in my first year that we had more traffic in that one year than she thinks she'd seen in 10 years um, with students coming in and out. Um, and that really goes back to my years working at um, my national headquarters where I had uh, individuals who took the time to nurture my talent. Um, and I really credit that attention, um, that care, that concern about my future um, as to where, where, you know, my path along the way. So mentoring, teamwork, um, that's very much, very much a part of my leadership style um, and that connection to service. Um, our premise is to whom much is given, much is required. So you always pay it forward. If you're in a position to do something uh, to make someone else's life uh, uh, easier to navigate or help them along the way, you do that. And all of those are principles um, that are attributed to, to my sorority. Um, so Kendall, we'll kick it to you. Yes, and, and you'll notice a very common theme throughout. Our motto for Phi Beta Sigma is culture for service and service for humanity. And then we have three pillars as well, brotherhood, scholarship, and service. Again, service is, an, is a very much a, a theme for us. And uh, that's how I see my role. That's how I try to carry myself. Uh, I'm serving the institution. I, my, my whole being is to be a zealous advocate for Dickinson College and Dickinson College while it is an entity, it, it's nothing without the people that are within it. That's the faculty, that's the employees, my colleagues, and most importantly, the students. Um, so it, it, it's providing service to make sure that we're always putting our best foot forward. I look at brotherhood the same way. While that is a, a, a male-centered term, I look at it much more broadly. And all of my colleagues, all of my employees, all of the students that I engage with, they all are my brothers per se, and they all are people that, that I try to, to do the best that I can to look out for. And certainly scholarship, you can't be at a higher education institution and not have a little bit of, of scholarship. And I try to continue to educate myself, whether it's uh, pursuing additional training and additional degrees myself, or whether it's encouraging others to do the same. So scholarship is absolutely of the utmost importance, because if you're not learning, what are you doing? So we've come to the end of our short time with you. Um, but as Kendall just said, um, I hope you, you've noted the connections here, the commitment to service. Um, and all of our organizations require a lifetime commitment to service. Um, and so we have different founding dates, uh, maybe different locations that we were founded, but our commitment to our communities through a life of service is something that we all share. Uh, so I hope you've learned a little about the Divine Nine um, and at least three of its members uh, here at Dickinson. So with that, we thank you for your time with us uh, and uh, have a good day.